we'd like to introduce Lorcan Collins, the biographer of James Connolly, to tell us a little more about them. Thank you. Thank you. 100 years ago today, 1,600 men and women occupied key buildings in Dublin City. Despite Owen McNeill's attempt to stop the rising, a decision was made on Easter Sunday to postpone it and instead, one day later, to go ahead on Easter Monday, 24th of April, 1916. The buildings occupied included Boland's Mills and Bakery, Eamon de Valera and the 3rd Battalion, Jacob's Factory, Tomás McDonough and the 2nd Battalion, Young Ned Daly from Limerick, who was 25 years of age, occupied the Church Street and Four Courts area with the 1st Battalion, and the South Dublin Union, now St. James's Hospital, was taken over by Eamon Kiant. The Irish Citizen Army under Michael Mallon occupied St. Stephen's Green, and City Hall, right on the doorstep of Dublin Castle, was also occupied by that same revolutionary force. And here beside us, in the building that still bears the scars of that week in 1916, the Headquarters Battalion occupied the General Post Office. Allow me, allow me to burst a myth, a long-held myth. The Rising has often been referred to as a poet's and teacher's revolution. Yes, there is much truth in the fact that at leadership level, there were poets. Amongst the 16 executed men, Patrick Pierce, Tomás McDonough, Joseph Plunkett, Roger Casement, Mick O'Hanrahan, and indeed James Connolly, all had poems published at one stage or another. And yes, McDonough and both Patrick and Willie Pierce were teachers, but when it came to the rank and file, the vast majority of those who took part were working class labourers. In fact, amongst those who are brave enough to come out that Easter Monday morning, the labourers of Dublin were hugely overrepresented in comparison to the census of 1911. Almost double the number of labourers per head of population were out in 1916. This was in fact a workers' revolution, one driven by the need for social change as much as mere anti-imperialism. James Connolly was right when he said in socialism and nationalism as early as 1897. If you remove the English army tomorrow, and hoist the green flag over Dublin Castle. Unless you set about the organisation of the Socialist Republic, your efforts would be in vain. England would still rule you. She would rule you through her capitalists, through her landlords, through her financiers, through the whole array of commercial and individualist institutions she has planted in this country and watered with the tears of our mothers and the blood of our martyrs. James Connolly did not engage in this tremendous fight for freedom so that his image could be used in the window of Brown Thomas on Grafton Street in order to sell, in order to sell 2,000 euro dresses. James Connolly fought to do something about the poverty and degradation that was so prevalent in Dublin. A city with the worst slums in Europe. No. Tenement buildings owned in many cases by the leading lights of the home rule movement. A city where infant mortality rates in 1914 were a staggering 142 per thousand births. To interpret that, for every thousand children born, 142 did not see their first birthday. And that number rose as he got to age two and three and four to the extent that Dublin had the 60% mortality rate amongst children. And that's what James Connolly 
and people like Jim Larkin before him tried to change. Big Jim is the most iconic statue on this street. He was erected in 1978, not outside the GPO, rather outside the Imperial Hotel, which belonged to the arch capitalist William Martin Murphy. <laughs> Martin Murphy had nothing against craft unions. You might be in the Leather Workers Union, or the Glass Bottle Workers Union, or the Bookbinders Union. What he did object to was that Jim, uh, or, or, or the, what, what's his name, uh, Martin Murphy, objected to Jim Larkin's union, the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, because that fear was there that the workers from all sectors of life, including labourers, would be members of that uh, one big union. And on the 31st of August, 1913, Larkin appeared in the window of the Imperial Hotel and spoke to the workers on a Sunday like today. The police ran in there, arrested them and dragged them out under arrest. And the great irrepressible female revolutionary, Countess Constance Markovitz shouted, three cheers for Jim Larkin. And a policeman smacked her in the face and all hell broke loose. The police came out of Abbey Street and Princess Street there and uh, uh, Sackville Place and with their buttons drawn they laid into the people of Dublin. And in that weekend of violence, three people were murdered by the police. And that's what prompted Jim Larkin and James Connolly and Captain Jack White to found a workers' defence force made up of the rank and file of labourers who were called the Irish Citizen Army. The rank and file, especially those in the Irish Citizen Army and the labourers amongst the Irish volunteers and the young radical women of the Coming Amman and the radical Fina Erin boys and there were some girls in the Betsy Gray Slua in Belfast which was made up mostly of James Connolly's daughters they were not blinded by mere nationalism. If that was the case, the proclamation would have just one line we declare independence from Britain. Rather, the proclamation promises a more equal society. Firstly, it is the Irish men and Irish women, which is rather wonderful, considering the fact that women did not have the vote in 1916. Women were accorded the vote in 1918, but hilariously, it was accorded to 30-year-old women alongside 18 year, uh, uh, 18, uh, 21 year old uh, boys. I, 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 always amused by the fact that a 21 year old man is supposed to have the same intellectual capacity and decision making capabilities as a 30 year old woman whereas in all fairness it's the other way around it just takes a lot of time in life to realise that but secondly in that beautiful proclamation is the paragraph the republic guarantees equal rights and equal opportunities to all its citizens and goes on to declare its resolve to pursue the happiness and the prosperity of the whole nation cherishing all the children of the nation equally yes we painted the post boxes green in 1922 but it is high time we really implemented the ideals of the proclamation as tom stokes here always calls it the template and guiding document for how our nations should be run. A nation of equality, a nation of fair distribution of wealth, a nation of opportunity. Thankfully, this centenary has seen an explosion of interest in the ideals of the men and women of 1916. A whole generation in the 32 counties of Ireland has been awakened to the nobility of the concept of a true republic. Once this day is over, the ideals of the proclamation will not be forgotten by this newly radicalised generation. Enda Kenny wanted the children of Ireland to rewrite the proclamation for the 21st century. They didn't. The children of Ireland read it and learned it off by heart because it's a perfect document for the 21st century already.
I want to say one last thing. It's very heartening to see such an enormous crowd of people come out today. And I want to single out Tom. I know he's going to kill me for saying this, but Tom has been at this since 1910. Tom Stokes deserves a big round of applause for Republic Day. Thank you, Tom.